Participation rose by a lot. Uh, so this data starts in 1960, so it went from about 38% uh, until about 60%, up until uh, up to 60%. And uh, what is a little bit less well known is that in the early 90s, it stabilized, okay? And this is uh, male labor force participation. This is everybody uh, in the working age population here. And you can see that this, uh, there's a steady decline in, in male participation. So what I'm gonna argue that in this paper is essentially that, um, oops, uh, basically, the changing trend in female participation you know, uh, plays a contribution in explaining some of the interesting changes in business cycles that we've seen in the United States. Um, and so what are these changes that I'm going to be focusing on? Well, the first one is a bit of a cheap shot. So if you are my age, you will remember that in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a very large uh, you know, debate in the structure of EAR and RBC literature about the fact that hours per capita appear to be non-stationary in the 70s and 80s. And so this had some implications about, for example, uh, whether in a structure of EAR a, uh, a TFP shock was contractionary or expansionary and so on. Obviously, if you have any notion of what is happening to female labor force participation, it's not surprising at all that you know, uh, uh, aggregate per capita hours would be non-stationary, but most of the people working in this literature did not have a notion. So this was a big debate at the time. More interestingly, uh, you know, a, a big phenomenon that we've kind of forgotten about to some degree after the financial crisis and the Great Recession was this, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, this phenomenon so uh, referred to as the Great Moderation, which amounted to a decline in the business cycle volatility of output and hours and other variables as well, but I'm going to focus on those, starting in the early 80s, okay? And also associated with this decline in business cycle volatility of output and hours, there were also some uh, medium round changes, uh, so changes in the medium round correlations between hours, uh, output, and productivity. Okay. And the last phenomenon um, which has uh, gotten a lot of attention, uh, especially after the Great Recession, was, is the phenomenon of the so-called jobless recoveries, essentially the fact that after a recession, uh, output recovers, but the recovery of employment is much slower than the recovery of output when you compare it to you know, um, earlier recessions. And so this, um, everybody agrees, started with the 1991 recession, and there is some literature on that. Okay, so what I'm going to um, argue is that this changing trend in female participation plays an important role. Obviously, as I told you, the, um, the fact that um, hours per capita looks on stationary in the 70s and 80s, and then they started looking more stationary, that's uh, a, sort of a, a, an obvious, you know, uh, obviously related to this changing trend in female participation. Uh, but also, with respect to the great moderation, uh, it is well known that female hours are less cyclical uh, than male hours, and there's a couple of explanations for this. One is this so-called added worker effect, as we mentioned earlier. So, uh, you know, most women are secondary earner in the context of a household. So if there is an anticipation that the primary earner will lose income or will lose their job because a recession is coming, the secondary earner has an incentive to either increase their hours or enter the labor force. The other thing is that women are predominantly employed in the service sector, a men in the goods producing sector, and the service sector tend to be less cyclical than the goods producing sector. So these are uh, two combinations, uh, the combination of these two facts, I'm sorry, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of um, imply that female hours are less cyclical uh, than, uh, than market hours. Um, and then I'm going to also show you that um, you know, so, uh, the changes over time in uh, female um, hours also contribute to some degree to these changing correlations that people have associated to the phenomenon of the great moderation. Uh, with respect to the jobless recoveries, uh, you know, essentially jobless recoveries started when female participation stopped rising. And I'm going to show you that actually uh, men's recoveries to some degree always look jobless and what really changed started with the 1991 recession is the behavior of female employment, both in a recession but especially in the recovery. Um, and so um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you some um, qualitative motivating evidence on these facts. And then I want to quantify basically, uh, you know, this analysis by uh, developing a real um, uh, dynamic uh, general equilibrium model that I'm going to estimate with Bayesian methods, sort of following what the, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the RBC and monetary economics literature does, and, you know, provide, you know, some, uh, some um, uh, you know, uh, identify these forces in the context of that model. 
Okay, now, I don't have a lot of time uh, you know, to uh, go over the literature, but it's sort of uh, to uh, fill in some of the gap that came out uh, from the presentation yesterday morning, there is a very large literature on the fact that female participation stop, uh, arose uh, primarily in the, second, uh, in the post-war period, but also actually started in the late 30s in the United States and also in other countries. So people have focused on medical progress, on te technological process, process, progress in the home, and uh, structural change, so this is a very well-known fact. I'm not you know, uh, uh, saying anything new here. Now, there's very little literature on the fact that female participation stopped rising in the early 90s. It's not even a very well-known fact. Um, and so uh, a couple of papers by Raquel Fernandez and uh, Alessandra Foglia and Laura Veldkamp who are actually, that are actually about the rise in female participation give us mechanically the flattening as well because they have a learning model by which women uh, learn about the cost of being in the workforce, presumably for their family or their children. And of course, if you have a learning framework, you have a rise and then you have a flattening out. Uh, now, I have a paper with um, Maria Prados where we actually look at the role of rising inequality, especially rise in, uh, in top in incomes, because we show that actually the flattening in female labor force participation is in fact a decline in female labor force participation of high-skilled women married to high-income men. Whereas if you look at low-skilled women, there hasn't be really been a decline uh, in the rise in female participation. So there's a sort of a negative income, negative wealth effect there. And then there's some empirical literature on the fact that uh, uh, female participation stopped rising. Okay, now uh, let me start with some of the motivating evidence. So the first thing that I want to show you, uh, just to sort of focus on, uh, uh, fix ideas on this notion of the stationary, non-stationary per capita hours is the following. So these are um, aggregate hours per capita uh, uh, um, constructed from the CPS uh, for men and women, where this is the, uh, the trend component from an HP filtered um, you know, uh, version of aggregate hours per capita. And you see that in the aggregate, the uh, male participation declined a little bit, had a trend decline. If I actually look at HP filtered male hours per capita, there is basically, they, they are flat over this period, and this is just you know, hours per capita for women, and you can see that there's a trend increase, and then this uh, flattening out. Uh, this is the cyclical component of aggregate hours per capita for men and women, and the red line is women. Eyeballing he it here, you can already see that you know, the amplitude of the fluctuations of female hours is slightly smaller than the amplitude of the fluctuations of male hours. So this is just one piece of evidence uh, showing you the, uh, the lower cyclicality. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to put, uh, to, uh, information that I wanted to, uh, to give you to put this in context is the following. So um, how do we think about the great moderation? So one way to look at the great moderation is look at, um, uh, compare the standard deviation of uh, the volatility of a bunch of variables after uh, 1985, and here I'm stopping in 2005 in order to remove the Great Recession, versus uh, this is 69 to 84 because I'm using the CPS annual data here. And you can see that the volatility of GDP went down by about half. Uh, the volatility of hours using the standard aggregate hours per capita variable coming from the establishment survey went down by about 30%. Um, if you use our hour series that we constructed from an, the micro data, it went down by about 50%, and this is just the employment to population ratio, the volatility of that also went down uh, by uh, about half. And this is uh, sort of uh, uh, another way to show you that women's hours are less cyclical than men's hours. So what we have here for the two different time periods, but you can just focus on one because the gender differences don't really change very much. Let's focus uh, on this period, for example. So you can see that um, uh, aggregate uh, per capita hours of men have a higher standard deviation at the cyclical frequency than GDP, and then it's lower for women. And then if we also look at the correlation of uh, uh, male versus female hours with GDP, you can see that it's higher for women. Uh, for men than it is for women. So that is the sense in which you know, female hours are less cyclical than male hours. And uh, this is, if you want, the extent of the great moderation measured in terms of volatility of output and hours. Okay, now the last piece of motivating evidence that I wanted to give you for this is the, this, the jobless recoveries. So I'm gonna give you um, a basically evidence on this using these event studies around recessions. I learned this at the Fed, I was doing this you know, five times a day, so uh, now you have to uh, enjoy this approach too. 
So what you have here is years since the unemployment trough, uh, which would correspond basically to the end of the previous expansion. Because uh, employment and unemployment behavior relative to GDP behavior is a little bit shifted, rather than using the NBR recession dates here, I'm looking at the unemployment rate trough as sort of the end of the previous expansion, the start of the current recession. And then I here I'm looking at five years out uh, from that unemployment uh, trough. So it will include, you know, the recession uh, and then you know uh, the recovery uh, or uh, most of it um, and what we these are log variations uh, you know from this initial period and um, this is um, uh, um, um, uh, aggregate hours uh, per capita and you can see so the blue line is men uh, the red line is women and this is the 69 to 70 recession this is the 73 to 75 and this is the 81 to 82 so clearly and the black line is just aggregate hours uh, you can see that here in these early cycles when female participation was rising you know basically women hardly had a recession in terms of aggregate per capita hours and then they had this really large growth uh, in the recovery and then and, you know, men, they had the recession and the recovery, I mean, it didn't look so great. So this was pretty flat. Uh, this was some recovery. This is a little bit faster here. Uh, but you can see that, you know, uh, the behavior of female hours, though they actually are a relatively small share of aggregate hours here, they're about 30%, you know, really imparts to some degree the behavior to, uh, you know, uh, aggregate hours per capita in the recovery. Now, moving forward, these are the last three recessions. So this is the uh, 1991 recession, 2001 recession and this is the Great Recession um, uh, where this is truncated because uh, uh, the data here stops in 2011 uh, for, for this. So same graph as before. So the 1991 cycle was a hybrid cycle so female participation you know, continued to grow until about 93 and then that's when it flattened out and you can see well, that you know, still women do not have much of a recession and in the recovery their aggregate hours per capita are flat but then when you get uh, by, by when you get to the 2001 cycle, you can see that there's very little difference between men and women, except the fact that women are less cyclical, so the drop here in aggregate hours per capita for women is a little bit less than for men. And then, you know, uh, and here also. Uh, actually, um, you know, so, so if you were following this stuff, the Great Recession was dubbed at some point the man session, because somebody at The Economist figured out that, you know, uh, men lost more jobs than women. This happens all the time. It's not something that uh, just was just uh, specific to the uh, Great Recession. Uh, of course, the fact that there was this big decline in the um, uh, construction sector, uh, you know, played a large role on male employment in the Great Recession that uh, we didn't see uh, in previous cycles. Now, to sort of quantify this, one thing that uh, we can do, which I lear also learned in the fact, is uh, run a counterfactual where we can force in these later cycles uh, the behavior of aggregate hours per capita of women to be the same as it was on average in those earlier cycles. So this would be the counterfactual and then I, com I compute a counterfactual aggregate hours per capita series. Yes? Yeah, that's one of the points, actually. You know, so uh, sort of working on this uh, has led me to think that you know the strong distinction that we make sometimes in macro between the trend, which we kind of get rid of somehow and the cycle you know, may not be that operative if the trend is non-neutral. So the, to the extent that the trend affects all variables equally, you know, then we can kind of get rid of it. We will scale, we will normalize in some way. But if the trend is not neutral, then you know, if you just rescale by something that is neutral, then you're going to have these residual effects on the, uh, on the trend that are affecting business cycle behavior. So this is actually one of the, if you want, of the observation that comes from this analysis as well. Yeah, so. Yeah, uh, well, uh, what do you mean by that? Because we do see a lower, um, you know, uh, volatility of aggregate hours per capita. So that we do see as well as output, right? So it's not 
So that's not exactly true. Uh, but the point that trends and cycles interact, I think that uh, is one of the takeaways from this uh, motivating evidence at least. OK, so here, what did I want to say? OK, so this is a counterfactual. This is the blue line. Aggregate hours per capita, forcing female aggregate hours per capita over this event window to behave as it did on average in those early cycles. The red line is the same counterfactual where I'm forcing the decline in aggregate hours per capita uh, uh, basically to be the same as it was in the data from uh, the trough of the unemployment rate to the peak. Um, uh, so um, what you see here, obviously, that if female hours had been behaving as if they, uh, uh, as when uh, female participation was rising, we would have had, you know, stronger recoveries. So this is a pretty, uh, and this effect is actually quite large as well. So this is just uh, motivating evidence, just to give you a sense that this is a, an important question to think about. Okay, now, oops. Um, okay, so most of uh, the paper is about uh, basically, though, not this motivating evidence, but uh, to, um, it, the goal of the paper is to introduce gender differences both in labor supplies and relative productivity in a standard real DSG model. Okay, so I, I'm going to get rid of all the standard, you know, monetary and nominal frictions. It's going to be a real uh, DSG model for now. Though, if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about the fact that, um, you know, those nominal frictions do serve a purpose as well. So, I, though I don't plan to introduce them here. But, um, so, what I, and, and my goal is really to be as close as possible to the real DSG models that people use, you know, to think about the effects of uh, uh, fiscal policy and so on. You know, so my department in terms of introducing gender is going to be very minimal and reduced form, partly because I think I've paid my dues in terms of writing a lot of papers as to why you know, female participation and female wages you know, changed over this time period. So for the, for the purpose of this paper, I'm not going to have a micro-founded theory of why we see women's labor supply or relative productivity change. Okay? So also what I then I want to do sort of to be as close as possible to this literature is take the model and estimate it with Bayesian methods. Um, and what is that uh, that's going to allow me to do is basically is, is to estimate processes for these gender specific shocks to labor productivity and labor supply and, um, and basically isolate their role uh, at the same time as I am estimating the, the processes for the other aggregate shocks that people you know typically have in the context of these models um, and um, and then uh, in, in the equilibrium of the, mo uh, the estimates in model, I can assess the contribution of the gender specific shocks uh, as well as all the aggregate shocks. And then I'm going to compare my model with gender differences to two versions of the standard model that, don't, that doesn't have gender differences. And then I'm also going to examine uh, different time periods uh, with flat and rising female participation to get at this issue of the jobless recoveries. But I have to admit that this part, um, you know, I, 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 I'm still completing, so I'm not going to have a lot on this, uh, except some evidence that I think is suggestive uh, that uh, the model is uh, sort of uh, can replicate uh, this jobless recovery idea that I had a I've just showed you, but that's uh, you, you know still in the works to some degree. Okay, I mean, yeah. Before you go to the, the model, in the empirical evidence, if you just focus on the on sectors uh, where women participate as men as, as much as men do, would you see the same differences in terms of uh, recovery to prices to, to cycles? I mean, yeah, so uh, the way I interpret your question, so if I look at sectors where the share of female workers is higher, uh, so basically if manufacturing, the share of female workers is, is, is low, um, and it's been increasing over time, partly because more men are now working in the service sector. Um, but um, uh, it, the issue is that the service sector where more women are employed is also a structurally changing sector that has a growing trend. And so you have actually two trends kind of that going hand by hand, the rise in female labor supply, at least up until the early 90s, and the fact that more women ended up in those service sector, which was, which was also and still is structurally rising. And so you have, and there is a literature, I, I mentioned a couple of papers there, that suggests that women have a comparative advantage in service type occupations for a variety of reasons. Um, and, um, and also women have a comparative advantage in brain versus brown occupations, and Another thing that we've seen, another sort of trend phenomenon, is that basically the increase in the returns to skill, which would have affected, you know, women uh, more.
more than men. Uh, so uh, going back to your question, um, the way uh, it, um, I'm not exactly sure uh, what you were driving at, but for example, let's just focus on the service sector. So one observation that people make is the service sector is less cyclical than the manufacturing sector, and they think that that's something that has to do with the, the demand for services or the production function of services. What I think, based on my work, is that part of the reason why the service sector is less cyclical is exactly that there are more women employed in the service sector and their labor supply tend to, tends to be this less cyclical because of this added worker effect. So here I'm not going to have sectors, though. Sorry. That's the issue, then the data you show us should be by sector. Yes. Well, well uh, yes and no, because I'm, what I'm going to do here, I'm, I'm going to abstract from sectors exactly because I want to be very close uh, to um, the, the standard, you know, uh, uh, real uh, business cycle model. But you can see these forces that I told you, so the fact that, you know, um, women may have a comparative advantage in the service sector, which is growing, or in skilled occupation, which are also growing, is going to be picked up in the model in a reduced form way that I'll just uh, discuss in the next slide. Yes, yeah, so uh, it's still the case that women have less technical hours within sectors. So we actually looked at this in a... For uh, women have less cyclical hours also within sectors, which makes sense because of this added worker component. But, it, yeah, but it, it's lower. If you look at within sectors, the difference in cyclicality of female and male hours is a little bit lower, but women still have lower cyclicality. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me quickly describe the model. So um, the household is a representative household uh, of unit measure, and it's divided uh, basically in uh, individuals of, uh, that are either men or women, female or male. So P is going to be the fraction by gender. I mean, this is going to be roughly 50% you know, uh, uh, in the data. And this is what the household utility function looks like. So the household likes consumption, and there's a habit over consumption. So this is a standard way that people get hump-shaped responses to a bunch of shocks, so that's why it's there. And then this is the disutility of working. So HJ would be the hours of either women, F, or men, M. And you can see here that the disutility of female and male hours enters separately. Uh, potentially, uh, men and women have different uh, short-run friction elasticities. This is this new J term, which is going to govern the friction elasticity. And then this phi, J, is going to be the this utility cost of supplying hours, uh, which may vary across genders. And this is going to be a structural shock in the model, uh, and I'm going to uh, basically estimate the process of the shock. So this is, and also the other thing uh, that I have here is a so-called discount factor or demand shock. This is this BT shock. Uh, that people you know, always put in these models, and that um, you know, is, uh, is useful to, for getting some dynamic pro uh, processes of the consumption response. Okay, now the households um, um, you know, uh, own firms, uh, this is their budget constraint, they consume, they invest, uh, they pay lump sum taxes that are used to finance government consumption, which is exogenous, they get labor income, they get rental income, and they decide capital utilization, this is the cost of that. So capital utilization here is variable, it's, a, it's the standard formulation that is used in these kinds of models. Uh, there are capital adjustment costs, so if you look at the capital accumulation equation, there is this cost of uh, adjusting investment, which is a, a a function of the change in investment. And again, this is the preferred you know, specification uh, in, in this kind of model to get the right behavior of investment uh, over the business cycle. Are you, are yeah. Are you going to have two separate wages? Or? Yes, yeah, they're going to be two separate wages. I'm going to get to that right now. Okay, so uh, the way, uh, the sense in which the economy differs on the production side is the following. So this is the per capita production function. So Y is per capita output, uh, K is per capita effective capital. And uh, this is uh, effective labor. So L tilde here is a labor input, uh, and A is just uh, you know labor augmented uh, neutral technological change. The labor input is a CES aggregator of female labor and male labor. Okay, and so what we have here, these are just uh, shares, the omega F and the omega M, and a row or uh, is going to correspond to the elasticity of substitution of female male, uh, male hours in the labor input, and the labor inputs are measured in efficiency units. So if I take uh, L tilde JT, F for M, uh, there's, two, uh, there's three components here. Uh, here, this is just a normalization. Uh, the market hours uh, at T relative to the steady state is one component. 
Uh, this is just a share of men or women in the population. And 80 is a gender-specific productivity parameter, where here, you know, for example, if this changes over time because there's you know, structural changes in the service sector or in the skill premium, in the model, this is going to be picked up by, by you know, gender variation in these 80 Js. Okay? Uh, and then there's an aggregate resource constraint that is completely standard. Now, for the rest of the, uh, of the paper, I'm going to work with this normalized production function um, where um, uh, basically I'm going to rewrite things in the following way. I'm going to rescale the aggregate labor input by, by basically the efficiency units of male labor, AM times PM. And then, uh, you, and then the uh, neutral component of technological chain is going to be the original A times this AT, uh, M, P, T, M. And then I'm going to express you know, this labor aggregator as a function of the relative productivity of men versus women. Because essentially in the data, that's all you can identify, which would be the ratio of ATF to ATM. Uh, this PTF over, over PTM is basically one <laughs> you know, for, for most of the sample. Uh, so this is um, basically the normalization. So with this normalization, actually, the omega F and omega N are going to be the share of female and male labor income at the steady state or at the balanced growth path because there's going to be a trend growth in A here. Okay? Everybody clear on this? Okay, good. So that's the only difference between the standard growth model is this utility function and the CS aggregator between female and male hours. Now, um, I'm just going to show you very quickly some equilibrium conditions because they highlight how the, the data is then identifying these gender-specific shock processes. So the first one, there's going to be a household optimality condition, which says, well, how much women are going to work versus men depends on the relative wages and the relative disutility cost of working. So this condition also tells us that we can't really separately identify FF over FM, but we can identify the ratio from the data. So um, going forward, I'm going to use this feature tilde F, uh, meaning the relative disutility cost of women versus men. And you can see that if you have an estimate for these new Js, which are going to be coming from the fresh elasticities, and then actually you could back out this phi tilde F from the data using wage data and hours data. Okay? So, and I'm going to show you some, uh, some, uh, some of that uh, in a minute. Uh, this is the men's labor supply optimality condition. So this is the wealth effects that Timo was ta were talking about earlier. This is the marginal utility of consumption here. Uh, and you know, so this is just a, a standard uh, thing that uh, the model uh, will need uh, to solve. Now, from the firm optimality conditions, so yeah. In the household, the, the matching between men and women. No, no. So the household is a representative household. There are men and women. They all consume the same because they share income completely, but they have different disutility of labor. So, so, um, so they have, yeah. So that's the difference. So it's a unitary household. There's no bargaining, nothing. So uh, full consumption sharing, I want to just have separately take into account the fact that labor supply may be differentially costly across men and women. Okay. Um, okay, so the firm optimality conditions also give us some, an expression basically between the female uh, uh, versus male uh, labor income share, which is going to be a function of these relative productivities. And again, if I have calibrated values for this elasticity of substitution um, and uh, uh, these um, you know, steady state shares of, of labor income for men and women, I can actually back out from the data a process for this A tilde. Okay? And actually, the two conditions together gives us a process for the equilibrium dynamics of female relative hours, which is kind of intuitive. So this is basically a positive constant, and it says, well, hours of women are going to be growing uh, more than hours of men um, you know, in an equilibrium if the relative relativity of women is going to be growing um, uh, more than uh, the, the, the relative cost of supplying labor is growing. And then if the fresh elasticity across women and men is the same, this term drops out. But if women have higher fresh elasticity than men, consistent with the data, then new F minus new M is going to be negative. So this term is going to then be positive. And it also tells us that if, we, if male hours are growing for whatever reason, female hours will be changing in the same direction. So for example, if there's a negative effect on male hours coming from some shock, uh, uh, a wealth shock or some other shock, it's also going to have an, uh, a negative effect on female hours if uh, female hours have higher fresh elasticity than male hours. And so this is what's captured in this expression. Um, so um, this is pretty much all I'm going to show you in terms of qualitative behavior of the model. Uh, but before I move to the estimation, I want to give you a flavor of how you know, uh, things change over time with respect to these uh, wage ratios and hours ratios that are going to identify the gender-specific shocks uh, in the context of the estimation. 
So I'm just going to use annual data from the CPS uh, to estimate the model because then I can go back all the way to 1969. If I wanted to use Bumphrey data, we would need to start in 82, which clearly is a bit problematic if you want to think about the grain moderation because you have no pre-grain moderation period. Uh, but you know, there is a literature that uses annual data for uh, thinking about long-term properties of business cycles, so uh, I'm sort of uh, following that literature. So what we have here is two lines. Um, the blue line is female over male hours, so HF over HM. And the red line is female over male income share. Uh, and you can see that um, uh, basically, uh, it, they're smaller than one, but they grow. And what I've uh, identified here with the vertical line is basically different phases of the dynamics of these two variables. So you can see that up until 1974, we only have five years. You, you can see that uh, the hours of women grow relative to men, but actually their share of income doesn't grow very much. And then in the 74 to 84 period, we see they both kind of grow at the same rate. And then 84 to 93, we see also a slowdown uh, of uh, female over male hours growth, and uh, though uh, the uh, um, labor income share of women still grows uh, you know, at a faster rate than men, this is the period where everything is basically flat, this 93 to 2005. This is, we're entering the Great Recession. As I told you, you know, uh, the Great Recession, and mo most recessions are men's sessions, so a lot of the dynamics that you see here is coming from the fact that you know, men lose more jobs than women do during the Great Recession, okay? So uh, there's these three phases, um, actually four phases, including the stationary one here uh, that are important. So what the model actually can give us, you know, thinking about these phases, is um, uh, you know, a theory of the solar residual aggregate labor productivity and how uh, basically these um, gender uh, changes in female relative, um, uh, these changes in female relative productivity and female labor supply can actually you know, explain some of the movement in the solar residual and uh, aggregate labor productivity. So this is the solar residual. Everything, all the hats here are uh, log changes uh, relative to the balance group growth path. And so this is a standard thing that you would get. The extra term because of this gender variation is that if female productivity uh, grows, um, you know, uh, then uh, this is going to increase uh, the growth of the solar residual. That's pretty obvious. Now, when we go to uh, aggregate labor productivity, which is called here P hat, uh, P hat T, so that's a log variation. So this is the term that you would get in a standard model, where here you would have aggregate aggregate hours per capita, here I have male hours, and the gender variation gives us this term. So you see this term is the same as here. So female relative productivity growth is going to boost aggregate labor productivity. However, if female hours are growing at a faster rate than men, that's going to reduce uh, aggregate labor productivity pretty obviously. So whether the fact that female labor supply is growing increases or, or reduces aggregate labor productivity depends on how strongly female relative productivity is growing relative to uh, how strongly hours of women relative to men are growing. So this is uh, you know, a, a simple um, um, uh, decomposition. So very quickly before I get into the estimation, let me just show you this. So, um, so this is the uh, um, uh, average uh, yearly log variation in the female relative productivity shock and the female labor supply shock backed out from the data with the calibrated value of the free elasticities and elasticities of substitution. And uh, so you can see that in this early phase, um, you know, uh, uh, women's labor supply went up because their cost of working went down, but their relative productivity also went down because women who entered in this early period were very young, inexperienced women, so they had low wages. Okay, so that's uh, what happened. And then when you see here, you know, th these women who entered, you know, stayed, so they gained higher experience, and then you had new women who entered with higher education levels. So here, actually, now uh, you can see that female relative productivity activity grows, um, but you know, uh, uh, women are entering at a faster rate, so actually, uh, you know, um, and uh, this is the, the, we see this from the decline of the disutility of working, so the contribution of women to aggregate labor productivity is actually negative here because they are more productive, but there's so many more of them entering that it's reducing average labor productivity. And then you can see that in the 80s, instead, you know, female relative productivity grows, actually their cost of working also goes up. But because of the rise in uh, female labor, uh, le relative productivity, uh, we still that, uh, have that overall hours of women grow. And you can see that now the, the contribution to um, aggregate labor productivity is still negative, but much lower because female productivity is growing so much. And here, pretty much nothing changes in this 10-year period. So uh, very quickly, I don't have time to do justice to all this um, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, to the implication that this has for long-run correlations, but let me just very quickly state, because I want to get to the estimation, that these dynamics of aggregate labor productivity, the total residual and also output, are very consistent with the evidence on uh, the great moderation, particularly this work by Gali and Gambetti, where they focus really on the, long, on the change in the long-run correlations with, uh, between output and labor productivity. In particular, they, they note that uh, between 1974 and the early 80s, there was a sizable drop in the correlation between hours and productivity that goes from zero to negative, and also a drop in correlation between output and productivity that goes from positive to zero. So this is something that the dynamics in the model can reproduce for the calibrated parameters. Okay? Uh, and then what they also show that in the 80s and 90s, the correlation of hours, productivity, and output uh, you know, starts to rise again, which is also consistent with the dynamics of female relative productivity and relative hours. Okay, so let me very quickly get to the estimation. I do not have time to go into all the details. So let me just quickly say that um, you know, I follow very closely what uh, people have done in this literature. So this is a Bayesian approach. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to calibrate some parameters and estimate some other parameters. The parameters that are estimated um, um, are uh, used uh, priors that are very uh, actually identical for some parameters to the ones that are, have been used uh, in, the, in the literature without gender differentiation. I just wanted to give you a sense very quickly of some of the important uh, you know, calibrated parameters. So here I assume that there's an aggregate free elasticity of about three. This is consistent with the work of Chetty and company. Sorry? Uh, no. Well, so, so that, that's the aggregate, uh, not, not the individual one. Yeah, so this is, this is the usual, uh, I don't want you to get into the detail of aggregate versus uh, micro, uh, micro free elasticities because I don't have time for that, Victor. Uh, so, uh, yeah, well, yes. So let me just sort of um, just say that um, you know this is close to the standard values that people use for real uh, uh, business cycle models like this. If you have a lot of uh, nominal frictions, you actually can get much lo uh, much lower aggregate of friction elasticity and still get propagation. So, but I have none of these frictions, so this is what is uh, consistent with that. Female versus male free elasticity is three. Uh, the elasticity of substitution between fem female and male hours in this version is about three. It's kind of on the high side. I've estimated it for another project. It's closer to two, but this is what you get for this um, uh, you know, uh, exercise. And then the female steady state uh, share of uh, hours uh, um, uh, of labor income is about 40%. OK, so let me uh, quickly um, get um, to the shocks. Uh, so uh, basically, the, uh, these are the oops. Uh, this is uh, pretty. Um, these are the parameters that are going to be estimated. So the growth rate of uh, TFP, uh, the curvature of capital utilization, the habit, uh, the curvature of investment adjustment costs, and then there's going to be a bunch of shocks uh, that are going to be stationary. So they're AR1 shocks. So this is the autocorrelation coefficient, and this is the standard uh, deviation of the uh, you know IID error component. And the shocks are the TFP shock the investment uh, productivity shock, the preference shock, the government consumption shock, and these are all the gender-specific shocks. For the gender-specific shocks, I'm going to assume that there's a trend and a cyclical component for, for uh, labor supply and for relative productivity. And um, the, the trend component, um, the way it differs from the cyclical component is that it has a much higher uh, prior on the value of the autocorrelation coefficient. Um, uh, but other than that, it is a stationary. Though I call it a trend component, it's not a non-stationary trend. It's, it's just a, a component that is allowed to be much more persistent than the cyclical component. Okay, so that's uh, that's the idea. So the important uh, you know parameters for me to estimate are obviously the one that correspond to these structural uh, gender specific shocks, but I'm also then going to estimate parameters for these standard shocks that are actually going to be different from the ones that you get in a standard model. So let me see if I can uh, quickly give you can give you an overview uh, of that. 
So for us, um, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk about how we reconstructed uh, aggregate hours per capita and wages from the microdata, except that we tried to do a very good job, especially so that wages and hours would be comparable with the aggregate uh, series that people use uh, in, uh, in the standard literature. Conceptually, I'm going to think about you know, um, uh, the steady state phase in the data and in the model to be the period after 93. Okay, uh, and then uh, the sample period is going to start in, in 69 and ends in 2011. So if you want, there's this transitional phase and this so-called steady state phase, where it's really a balanced growth path uh, phase. Um, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to estimate the full model over these two subsamples as well, and then I'm going to compare it uh, with uh, standard models that don't have the gender differentiation. Okay. So this is the smoothed, realized, estimated path of the trend components of the gender-specific shocks. This is the relative productivity shock, and this is the relative uh, uh, cost of working for women. So this starts in 69 and it ends in 2001. Uh, uh, the units here are just the absolute values of the shock. So you can see that women's relative productivity grows as a steady growth rate up until um, this is the early 90s. And then you can see the average is pretty stable, but you have an increase in the volatility. The female relative labor supply shock, you can see it declines very strongly here, and then it's stable here, and now it, it rises again. Uh, but you know, overall, you know, female hours here are, are growing or stable. That's because female relative productivity is really causing the increase in hours in this phase, as opposed to the decline in the utility cost of working. Now, for men, uh, I'm also allowing a labor supply shock for men, partly um, uh, you know, to capture uh, possibly taxes. I didn't talk about taxes here, but you know, taxes are there. They affect uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the incentive to work. And so you can think about this uh, you know, male labor supply shock as affecting you know, um, uh, uh, coming from household income or from aging of the population and other factors. And you can see that um, basically uh, this shock goes down here and then it stabilizes over here. Okay? Uh, and then I, won't, I don't have time to talk about the cyclical components very much, so let me just jump to the aggregate shocks. Um, so these are the estimated processes for the aggregate shocks, so the productivity, investment, uh, t technology shock, the demand shock, and the government consumption shock. What I want to show you here is a couple of observations. So you can see that for investment, demand, and government consumption shock, there is a decline in the volatility of the shock that starts in the mid-80s. So this would be sort of the great moderation kind of behavior. So people who uh, study the great moderation are concerned about uh, do the sh are the shocks smaller or something else changed. So I find here that some of the shocks are smaller. Uh, that literature typically finds that the shocks to TFP are also smaller. Here the shocks to TFP actually have higher volatility in the great moderation period. And that is because essentially the female um, labor supply shock and the uh, um, female relative productivity shocks have opposite effect on output and hours than the TFP shock. So those shocks you know, have an implication uh, or, or affect the equilibrium behavior of output and hours. And so once you take into account of those shocks, you actually find that the TFP shock, uh, the volatility of that shock actually increases in the second period in the data, where in a standard model you would find that it goes down, uh, which I, I will show you in a second. This is just the variance decomposition. Let me just focus on output and aggregate hours per capita. So the yellow is the TFP shock. Uh, the green is the investment-specific uh, technology shock. And then um, uh, all the rest is this gender-specific shock. So here, um, uh, the, um, uh, the um, uh, sorry, the red is the government consumption shock. So the gray here is the trend component in the female relative productivity shock. Uh, the white is the trend component in the female relative labor supply shock. And uh, the, the pink and, and dark gray here would be the cyclical components, and the brown is the male uh, labor supply shock. So you can see that you know, at a business cycle frequency, two to four years, remember this is years, uh, all these gender-specific shocks account for about 15 to 25% of the variation in output. But then when we go to aggregate hours per capita, they play a huge role, okay? including this male you know, or aggregate labor supply shock here that you can see accounts for about 50% of the variation in aggregate hours per capita. And all the gender relative shock account for about 20 to 30 percent of the variation. So these are, you know, these are shocks that matter in terms of the behavior of aggregate variables. And if I look at aggregate hours of women uh, and men per capita, you can see that for women, um, basically all the female-related uh, shocks have play a 
Rouge's role, particularly uh, the trend component of the labor supply shock and of the female relative productivity shock. And, and for men, it's mainly the, 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 the labor supply shock. Now, moving on. Uh, what I want to do uh, with this uh, uh, now is uh, sort of expose you to two versions of what I will refer to as the standard model. So take away all the gender differences. We're back in uh, you know, RBC world. And um, I'm going to look at two versions. One in which the utility cost of working, the fee, is just a parameter, which would be what you get in a standard model. And then in another version, I'm going to allow it to be a shock uh, that has a trend and a cyclical component. Um, and, and so you know, I can get some of the trend in aggregate labor supply that's coming from women's, but I just have no gender variation. And obviously, these simpler versions of the model explain less of the data. So if I look at the maximized block likelihood, it's much smaller. But what I wanted to show you is a couple of things here. Um, so if I leave out these gender-specific shocks, I get different implications of what the aggregate shocks, you know, uh, or how the aggregate shocks behaved over time. So have you seen this figure before? This is the estimated uh, TFP shock uh, for the, my model with gender uh, variation. This is in a model there's, where there's no gender variation, but there's still a decline uh, in, uh, um, in the cost of working in the aggregate that gives us this labor supply increase. And this is a standard model with a fixed parameter determining the disutility of working. A couple of observations here. So first of all, I already told you that here, actually, the volatility of TFP rises in the later period. It's kind of hard to see here, but in both these models, actually the volatility of the TFP shock declines in the mid-80s, consistent with what happens to all the other shocks. Which, this is telling us that essentially, if we don't model this gender variation, you're picking up the great, uh, the great moderation with a lower, basically, volatility of the TFP shock. Here, in my model, uh, it, it's being picked up by the fact that now output is driven by other shocks who are, uh, that are a lot less volatile. And, and so actually, the volatility of P TFP doesn't need to decline to get that output you know, is less volatile uh, over this time period. Um, um, this is the investment uh, productivity shock. This is pretty consistent across different versions of the model. It's pretty well identified. Uh, what is really interesting is both the demand shock. So this is the preference shock, some part of agents, and then the same uh, holds for the government consumption shock. So uh, version with gender, you see there's basically no trend in this preference shock. So notice here that if B goes down, people want to consume more, but also work less. Okay? Uh, and also in the standard model with the labor supply trend, this is pretty flat. If I take the weight of force that increases labor supply, you can see that the estimated process for B has a sharp downward trend. This is how the standard model gets people to work more. They want to consume more, and hence they need to work more. And so again, there's a mis if you want a misspecification here, that if we don't model these gender-specific you know, trends in labor supply and relative productivity, we're attributing something to a demand shock, which is really you know, a labor supply or a productivity shock. So if we are going to use this model to think, I, I don't know, about the effect of taxes or other policies, it's going to give us a very different results uh, than this model or even this model. Okay? So this is actually something that I'm working on right now. Uh, so um, I'll be able to talk a, a little bit about this later. Uh, one minute? Okay. So let me then uh, quickly uh, show you uh, this. Okay? Uh, I want to very quickly show you uh, the comparison uh, between time periods. Okay. So one exercise that I do to try and understand uh, the impact of the changing trend is estimate the model over the two uh, um, sub-periods, so the ones that I call the transitional phase and the one that I call the stationary or steady state phase. So this is um, the variance decomposition of output. Uh, obviously, what stands out here in the second period is that the contribution of the female relative productivity shock and the labor supply shock in the trend is much, much smaller uh, than in this first period. That's pretty obvious. Of, uh, um, but uh, when we look at, um, actually, at hours um, you know, uh, per capita it, 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 in the aggregate, this doesn't change uh, you know, very much. So it's mainly the, uh, you know, uh, this um, 
the, the, the smaller role of uh, female relative uh, uh, supply shock and uh, uh, productivity shock, we see it in output. And I'm going to conclude with this uh, impulse response function here, um, where this is a, um, the response at, of aggregate hours per capita to a, a positive technology shock in the first uh, transition period versus the stationary period. Now, uh, a, a couple of caveats here. So this is an expansionary shock, so we would expect hours uh, to increase eventually, and we see it here. Uh, initially, hours decline because of uh, investment adjustment costs, right? So, uh, but basically, what you see, um, uh, you know, in, in this graph is a couple of observations. First of all, the, uh, uh, both the impact response of hours and the, um, uh, uh, the maximum response of hours is uh, larger in the second period than it is in the first period. So meaning if you have a TFP shock in the second period, it has a bigger effect on hours than in the first period. Why? Because the technology shock is more important for determining the variation of hours because all these gender shocks are now you know, less operative. Uh, particularly the trend component is not active. And uh, so what I'm working on is essentially uh, you know, um, constructing a counterfactual uh, that can explain this a little bit better, but this is what I have so far. Okay. Well, thanks. I think given that we're over and people look hungry, we can yes. have questions. Absolutely, yes.